Okay, so good, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to SNF1. Uh, we'll be looking at one of the organ systems of the body, in particular, the integumentary system. In terms of how this class will progress for today, we will be talking generally on the topic of the integumentary system, looking holistically at the characteristics of the different parts of the integumentary system and its role in, the product, in protecting you from infection. The other thing, so once we're completed with that, we'll then move on to multiple choice questions. And in the doing of the multiple choice questions, we will be able to delve even further in some of the topics associated with the integumentary system. For today's class, the lecture has been recorded. So I would encourage you once we are finished, all you have to do is just click on the link as shown. So let's click on the class lecture on the integumentary system click and it will direct you to the YouTube video on the integumentary system. So once we finish for today, I encourage you to go look through it and also the notes for based on the lecture, the PDF of the PowerPoint is located right here. And the, this activity sheet, as we mentioned, that is to be done. And um, there is an interactive quiz. This is for the um, work, well, not work, I don't like to use the word work, but this is a further exercise for you to reinforce some of the concepts associated with the integumentary system. All right, so let's go. Let's start the integumentary system. So when we're talking about integumentary system, what comes to mind? Let's talk generally on it. What, what does the integumentary consist of? What parts? Skin. 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 Is skin it only layers. the skin? Right. So it's more than just skin, even though the most prominent part of it is the skin, but it's also skin, hair, and nails. And if you were to look at all three of them, skin, hair, and nails, and you had to put one word uh, to it, what, how, what word would you use then to describe skin, hair, and nails uh, in terms of their function? What word would you describe for it as it relates to the, um, uh, the integumentary system? So skin, hair, and nails. Protection. 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 Very good, right? Barrier. So one word. So the one word you would use for the role of the skin, hair, and nails is protection. And that's what they do, what they do, what it does. Somebody wants to elaborate on, me, on it a little bit. How, what does your skin protect and how does it do it? Anybody want to say elaborate on that? Let's look at a, at an, a certain scenario. If somebody has a burn, right? Let's say a severe burn over, let's say about 80% of the body. Would that, what is the main thing as a medical practitioner that has to be done with this individual? What do they have to protect against? One word begins with I. Infection. Infection, infection. infection. Yeah, that's the number one problem. Notwithstanding the damage, notwithstanding the fact that, yes, it's a big open sore, it's a wound and it needs healing. But the major thing that has to be done is the whole issue of, wow, this person is now open to infection. So that points to one of the functions of the skin. It protects against infection. It's very effective in terms of protecting against infection. And we only truly recognize that fact when we don't have a skin. And that process occurs if someone does get, let's say, a severe burden. All right, so skin, infection. And does the skin do anything else? It regulates the body temperature. It regulates. How does it do that? How does the skin regulate body temperature? That homeostasis. Is true. Homeostasis is the, is the maintenance of the constant internal environment. So you're partially right. It does, it does assist in keeping that constant internal environment. But how does it do it? It does something in particular. Let me give another example. If That's you're good. very hot... Let's say running. Sweating. Sweating. Sweat. Right? It excretes the arm water. Right, water. And what that does by conduction, heat is conducted into the water. And then by evaporation of the sweat, there's a cooling effect. Now you might say that sounds a little odd. How is it that evaporation could cool you down? Because when you think about it, you're heating up something and it cools you down. Well, anybody here, if you ever, um, you know, when you have fever, what do you put on your skin when you have fever? Why your mother is burning your skin? 
Oye, right? oye significant on the Alcalado Glacial, yes, yes. What else? Lima Paul. Yes, I don't know if you still have it. Made in Guyana, Demarara okay. area. Right, Vix. Okay. So let's for now focus on the Alcalado Glacier and the Lima Paul. What's the active ingredient in those two do those two things? When we look at alcohol? Yeah, hence the reason lime alcohol is really just a lime flavored alcohol. So you might ask yourself then, well, how does alcohol cool you down? Well, the vapor temperature, let's look at the boiling point of alcohol. What is it? The boiling point of alcohol is 78, 78 degrees Celsius. That's a little high. Vaporization point of alcohol is 79, if not. Alcohol boils at 173. That one, uh, it's a little, these are a little mm -hmm. high. So what they do with the alcohol, they could lower by adding certain things to it, they could actually lower the vaporization point as the temperature at which alcohol, well, you know what, and that 100, I am sure it's not what it is. Yeah, so the it could lower the vaporization point by adding things to it such that when you have, let's say, a fever and, or let's say, a running, and in the case of when you're looking at alcohol, your body's temperature is sufficient to vaporize that water. Now, sufficient, when I say sufficient, what do I mean by that? Well, so your body is generating heat. Now, that heat is used to vaporize um, in the case of, of your body, and when you're sweating, it's used to vaporize your sweat. And in so doing, the heat moves then from, if you want to look at it in this regard, it moves from the area of high concentration to low. Your body is hot. The, your sweat is relatively cool in terms of the sweat that is produced. So now the heat, it moves from your body to the sweat itself, and then that is vaporized. So the thing is, in vaporizing the sweat, you're moving heat away from your body, and that actually gives you a cooling effect. You feel the same thing when you use Alcalado Glacial or you use perfume. Perfume, the base of perfume is an alcohol, and the which is, when you put it on your skin, the alcohol vaporizes and it carries with it the odor molecules associated with that perfume. And that is why, you know, some person, when you do put it on, you smell it. The reason why you smell it is that it is vaporized off of your skin because of the fact that the heat comes off. And we, as we might be aware, when you do spray cologne or perfume on your skin, you feel cold. That area feels cold. And the reason it feels cold is because the heat is being used to vaporize the alcohol. So alcohol in general has a very good cooling effect when used, utilized. And in fact, back in the day, I remember my, <laughs> my mother telling me that one. I don't know if anybody ever heard some of the older heads speak to it, but what they would use when you have fever, they would use, literally take rum and nutmeg, grate nutmeg into rum and put it on your, on your forehead. Anybody ever hear that one before? No? No. No, no. all right, talk to somebody older yes, heads. You never hear that one, yeah. It's not only that, the nutmeg oil as well has beneficial effects even when you're feeling hot. But that's what they would do. So they take out the vat, pour it in a plate, you know, a little saucer, a little bit of vat, go and get um, a nutmeg and just literally on, on a grater and just grate it into the um, rum and like make a paste with it. So you grate it now, like about half of the nutmeg. It's not too much rum you're putting. Make a paste and then you put it on the person's head. And that actually, so you can never tell, maybe sometime somebody might have a fever and you don't have um, alcalado glacial. Yeah, that is used as a cooling agent as well. Notwithstanding that, nutmeg in and of itself is a, as an aromatic is very therapeutic. Okay, good. So skin infection, that is one of the important um, aspects of it. Yes, it maintains homeostasis by keeping the temperature down because when we do get um, too warm, one of the things you do have sweat glands that secrete sweat and that sweat when it's vaporized off of your skin, it cools down your body. Anything else in terms of what the body does, it, what is function of the skin? Anything else? Well, yes. 
All right. Well, uh, what about when you think the about skin color? Skin color, right? And what is the natural, what is the protein associated with skin color? It begins with M. It's a protein. Melanin. Melanin, yeah. right? And of course, you have the melanocytes, which are the cells that actually produce melanin. So is melanin a good thing? Okay, that's a relative question. The answer is yes. In terms of the protective qualities, because what it has been shown, the incidence of skin cancer among persons of color is significantly lower than those um, who don't have significant amount of melanin present in their skin, aka Caucasians and others, other, as they say, light-skinned persons. Right? So it does have a protective effect against UV light and the subsequent formation of skin cancers. So that's another important thing as it relates to the skin itself, if you do have the presence of melanin there. Let's look at some of these questions and then we'll look to get in a little deeper. All right, question one. Yeah. Okay, so question one. Unlike the other major membranes of the body, some membranes lack an epithelial layer. Now, not, that is not part of our um, course. The answer is synovial, but you're not, that is not on the syllabus, so we'll, we'll jump that one. Let's look at question two. The function of the skin include all of these except which one? Taking in the nutrients. Taking in nutrients, correct. Well, we'll eventually, yep, correct is right. Does it regulate body temperature, the skin? Yes. It yes. sure does, yes, by sweating. We mentioned that. But some people say perspiration. Um, retards water loss. Does it do that? Yeah. yeah. How does it do that? How does it slow down water loss? Well, it's something that the skin secretes. Oils. Oils, or some people say yeah, sebum, which is present in the sebaceous glands, and in essence, it's oil. So that oil, literally, it makes your skin waterproof, which is why when you dive in a pool, you ever realize when you come out, you can just stand up and, you know, just hang down your hands. When you look, you'll see either one, the water beating on your skin, or two, you know, your skin looks relatively, while it will be moist, but it looks relatively dry. So you know, for the most part, your skin is waterproof because of the secretions of the sebaceous glands. And what would happen if you have over secretion of sebum? If it's, you know, if you have a whole lot of sebum being secreted? Black pores. Right, it forms like pimples, ultimately blackboards. Okay, just give me one second. I was expecting this import. Yeah, hello? Hello? Yes. Okay, yes, great. Sir. Yes, yeah. sir. So function of the skin in terms of, it doesn't take in, it, it retards water loss, regulates body temperature, and it prevents the entry of microorganisms. Yeah, could you, what are the most, based on this, what are the most vulnerable places on your body where if you are a microorganism, where you would look to enter? Since we have established that the skin, you know, prevents entry, are there areas where the skin is either thin or maybe it has a opening or anything natural occurring, naturally occurring on your body? Could you think of any openings on your body? Your nose, your mouth. Yes, your nose, your mouth, your eyes, your ears, your vaginal passage, your anus. Right? All of these areas, right? You're, these are openings and things could go in. If you would notice, generally speaking, 
there is some protection, some form of protection in those areas where you have openings or orifices. So the anus, you do have a sphincter muscle, which, which, any, which effectively does prevent, you know, entry of things back up into the anus itself. When you look at the vaginal passage by its very nature, it is acidic, very acidic, which is why during the reproductive process, when semen enters the vaginal passage, the semen actually has alkaline uh, liquids associated with it that neutralizes that acidic environment of the vagina. If that wasn't the case, the acidic environment would literally destroy the sperm. So the body is a fascinating thing. Secretions from the bulbourethral, corpus, and prostate, they actually neutralize that environment and thus prevents the, um, the, the vagina from actually digesting the sperm. That is very, very important. When you look now at the mouth, the mouth, well, it's not exceedingly acidic, but where does the mouth lead to? What area does it lead to that is particularly acidic? Stomach. Yeah, and it's not by accident because food is very important for us. Why do we need to eat food? Energy. For energy. Okay, I thought somebody was going to say because it tastes good, right? But for energy, quite right. So we needed to break it down. So therefore, since that is something really important to our existence, that is why when the mouth actually via the esophagus leads to the stomach, gastric glands in the stomach, they secrete HCl hydrochloric acid, making the environment of the stomach particularly harsh for micro. Uh, microorganisms. When we look at the opening of the eyes, what protection does the eyes have in terms of providing a barrier to um, different microorganisms? The um, eyelash. The eyelash, yes, yes, the eyelashes. And tears in and of itself, right, you do have glands. It is, they, they contain enzymes which destroy bacteria. So which is, and you, that is why one of the things that happen, you know, when you things blow into your eye, you usually see tears being secreted. Granted, it does wash out, flush out the environment, but also within uh, the tears themselves, they do have enzymes that destroy bacteria. So that's another protection there. What about in your air? What, what protection do we have there? Wow. Wax cerumen, right? The ceruminous glands in the air, it secretes that white, well, not white, well, different colors, varying colors of shades of brown, right? And that actually acts one for creature, hemi creatures, for little, let's say, insects walking into the air. It traps them and it also traps dust and by extension, other smaller microorganisms when it does go into the air. So the serum, serum, serumen or wax is very important in terms of protecting the air. Anybody ever had a small insect go down into their air? Or heard of an instance? And what do you think you'll do? If let's say a small cockroach goes down into your air, what do you do? Especially sometimes this happens with babies, you know, or younger it's children. It's quite an annoying feeling to have it that. Is. Correct is right. How do they get it out? You have to go to the hospital mm -hmm. and do they, they flush it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do they use to the flush it out? And, with mm -hmm. syringe and uh, saline say, water. I want to say it's haline or H2O2. Anybody could correct me on that? Hydrogen peroxide. I think they do that. I know in terms of from a home remedy, if you're home, what, what, what is do? What do you want people to tell you to do? If something goes out. Right. <laughs> is, any, is boiling oil is put on your ears? Yeah, you could use hydrogen peroxide because that high oxygen will kill them, right? But the oil, one of the good things with the, why oil might be a little bit more effective than, now mark you, the H2O2 will work particularly well in killing it, right? But we're looking now at oil, warm oil, right? It ought to be boiling, you got to be careful of that because believe you me, if you, <laughs> that'll be another story if you put boiling oil in your ears, right? So it has to be warm, always check the temperature before you put it in, right? But the other thing with it, it, it retards the movement of whatever it is, you know, the insect. Because sometimes, let's say, if you do put any peroxide, it still want to move around. But when you put any oil, it's sticky. So it actually slows down, it retards the movement and just um, makes it a little more pleasant for you. Right? So so many old people will tell you that, yeah, warm some oil, take something, put it in a little spoon on the fire. And when it warm, test the temperature and then pour it down in your yes, air. Yes, so oil, they tell you warm, especially Correct. 
Correct, correct. Poison correct, correct. So keep that in mind. Is that effective from a medicinal perspective? Yeah, because we do have the air drum, the, tim right, the tympanic membrane, which does prevent things from going further down. So you're not really at risk in terms of oil running up in your brain, right? In terms of because you do have that protective layer there. Good. Let's go to the next but, one. But uh, wouldn't this, go ahead. It wouldn't, wouldn't this oil um, could also give you an infection in your air? If it remains there, so that's a good point there. So after, let's say you uh, put it in and you extricate the insect or what have you not, it's always good to let it drain. Tilt your head and let it drain out. That is important. So I'm glad you did bring it up. So notwithstanding the fact that, yes, you do put it in, it is important to drain it out. Would it promote infection? Mm, do things really grow in oil? Because oil is a high lipid, low oxygen content. There's always the there's always something that could grow in, in any of the harshest environments. I will not doubt things could live in there. But all that being said, it is important to drain the head afterwards. So you're not just pouring it in and leaving it in. No, no, no. Right? You pour it in, extricate the insect, and then lean your head. If you can't see it and you don't have a tweezer, after you put the oil in and leave it for a little bit, if you lean your head, by its very nature, when it's draining out, it will bring whatever little insect with it. Yeah. So, however, I could see complications, which would probably necessitate you going to the um, hospital. If, in particular, the insect if it's kind of large and it gets lodged up there, you know, jam up and it can't. Even though you put the oil or the peroxide is not coming out, then you need to go. And what they will have to do is uh, carefully extricate, use a tweezer to pull it out. All right. But yes, I'm glad you brought up that point. Infection, as we say, that's a really bad word. That's the worst word you could possibly hear, you know, in medicine, in the world of medicine. So you always want to limit that. So most definitely you would want to drain the head um, after putting in the oil or the peroxide. Even though with the peroxide, the peroxide breaks down naturally into water. So that one is not too bad, which is probably why they use it um, as opposed to the oil. But most definitely with the oil, you want to drain it out. Let's go. The next one, within the skin, a basement membrane can be found separating the something and the something. Hmm. All right, so we're talking about skin and all these layers. Let's have a look at what these things look like. All right, so let's change gears and have a jump. Let's have a jump and look at this one. All right, so this is a cross section of normal skin. And let's see if you can name some of these features here. Now, the skin has three layers, right? One, two, three. What is this first layer known as? This one up here. Epidermis. Epidermis. Well, that's what you say in me. I know, but you allocated me, right? One is the epidermis. This business end, where you're seeing all the drama, all these structures. What do, what do you call this area? Yeah. Dermis, right? The dermis. And that one is the epidermis. This one is the dermis, epi really referring to outer. So the outer dermis layer is here. Then you have the dermis. And this one here, what are those yellow things, incidentally? Fat. Fat, fat. fat yeah. Fat. Yeah, adipose tissue, right? Fat. So, and what does the fat serve to do? Protect, insulate. It protects, it insulates. And what are, uh, so protects in terms of providing like a cushioning effect. Very much like bubble wrap, you know, when you buy things, let's like say from abroad, Amazon or what have you not, uh, or even if you buy appliances and they put bubble wrap around it, it has a cushioning effect. And that's the same thing that happens with the fat. So this layer here, number three, what is that layer known as? Subcutaneous. Like right, it's subcutaneous. Sub so sub meaning below, below the cutaneous layer. So this is the bottommost layer. So subcutaneous layer, also known as the adipose uh, layer or the fat layer. Number four, what is this things that, the things that protrude out from your skin called? Hair. Hair, yeah, hair, yeah. right? And let's look at number five, the whole, what is number five? Oh, yeah, I really know what number five point into now. I wish I could have pulled it up. I would guess so, that's my best guess. Let's see if we have something, we have anything like a pore there? Yep, sweat gland pore. Yeah, I would want to say, yeah. Well, when we correct it, we'll see if it's right or not. The next one is six. What is this pointing to? Hmm. I thought this was uh, when we have the epidermis, this outermost layer.
Might that be the receptor? Well, let's find out. We seeing any receptor? No, that wouldn't be the receptor. Touch receptor, hey! Nah. We, we all on the we all on the layer. Which one do you think it is? What is it? It's probably one of the layers. Shatam, one of the five layers. Well, we'll see. We all in learning because seven is most definitely is one of the layers it's talking about. Um, the outermost stratum corneum, eight, because these are pointing to. Well, basal is really the bottom one, nine. We just put it in just because. And let's check. <laughs> you got six out of 10 poor. Study again. <laughs> study more and try again. So we got um, six. So epidermis was right, dermis, subcutaneous, the hair shaft, the sweat boy, you were quite right. This number six is really the outermost layer, the stratum corneum. Right? So there's the stratum corneum, that's the outer layer. Seven was pointing to a capillary. Now do it, you know, you ever see the capillaries in your skin? Particularly for persons who, uh, as they say to use the term light-skinned, and I hope that is not an offensive term, but for persons who are particularly light in the area of your nose, you often, you could sometimes see, you ever see people like that? Who are light, who are very light skin in the areas of the nose, you can actually see like capillaries under the skin. Anybody ever saw that? Yes, sir. Yeah. So those are very fine. What is the diameter of a capillary? Approximately how, how wide is a capillary? Anybody have any idea how fine they could get? Yeah. How about? So uh, I just remember you, you see the space between your fingers that gets Correct. Covered. That? that. Correct, and you divide, that is um, one millimeter, you divide that into a thousand, thousand, and it's approximately 30 of those, it's about 30 micrometers in diameter. So this thing is really, really fine. It's very, very fine. Basically, the only reason we really see them on the nose is because blood is running through it, but they're very, very fine indeed. All right, the stratum basale, the papilla, and number 10 was really pointing to the blood vessels. I wish you could have blown this up a little more. Maybe you all have really good eyes, but this one is, is troubling me in terms of seeing it. I just wish I could just blow it up. Anyhow, it is what it is. Let's look a little bit, a little more detail in those things. All right, so those five layers, let's look at those um, as we mentioned them there. Right, so when we're looking at the skin, this is, it's basically, it's the same thing we are looking at. So this is the diagram you're looking at. So you have the stratum corneum, granulosum, spinosum, and the basale. Well, the basale means base. So there's the base, baseline here. The spinosum, the granulosum, so-called, because when you take a look at it, it's granular. And the corneum, this is the cornified layer or the outermost one. So these are the four layers associated with the skin. Let's see if we could get a little more um, corneum. So here it is in a little more detail. The corneum, okay, it changed the terminology on it. Right, the stratum corneum, one, two, three, four, five. So these are the five layers. The stratum corneum, lucidum, lucid because it's clear. Lucid means uh, clear, or it can be seen easily. Granulosum because it's granular. The spinosum is this layer, and the bottom one is the basale or the base layer. Then we have a melanocyte, as we mentioned. These are the ones that contain melanin in them, and the dermis is below. What does a Merkel cell do? It's not on the um, it's not on the syllabus, but just throwing it out there. Anybody knows what a Merkel cell does? So it keeps the skin moist. The Merkel cell in terms, okay, that's a very one, nice one. That's a thought. It's not totally correct um, oh. in terms of the research out there. But it was okay. a nice guess. I said, um, seeing it attached to the sensory neuron. Yeah, so. So I believe it's something to do with touch. Right. The cells oh, are very closely sensation. nerve endings, right? So they are associated with touch. You're very right. And that's a nice 
parallel you drew there, since it's closely centering you on, the Merkel cell is associated with touch, the feeling of touch sensation. But for the purpose, in terms of the skin, the layers, you take note of these five, corneum, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, and basale. Hmm, is there a way to remember it? Anybody? When in doubt, Google it out. Way to remember the layers of the skin. Right? Oh, no, not those. The five. But I want the mnemonic. Oh, they do have one. All right, so mnemonic of the layers of the skin. Let's just look at the at what they have, mnemonic. So the corneum, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, and basale. Right? Come, let's go get, come, let's get sunburnt. Right? Come, let's, that's from the bottom to the top. So from the top to the bottom, sorry. Uh, come, let's get sunburnt. So that will be the corneum, lucidum. Get will be granulosum. S, spinosum. And B, basale. I find that one sounds good. Come, let's get sunburnt. You know, fine? Anybody could think of one better? With the letters B, S, G, L, C. Could you think of a better one? No, sir. That that, good. that sounds just right. So we'll use that, right? Come, let's get sunburned. All right. So do <laughs> come. I like it. So come, let's get sunburned. Come, let's get sunburned. Nice way to remember it. So that is C L G S and B. Come, let's get sunburned. And the reason why, in terms of the cells, the basale has columnar epithelial, they multiply and produce the keratinocytes. So it produces keratin, right? The spinosum, the prickly cell layer. It looks like spines, right? And that's why they call them spinosum because they contain bridges in them, which looks like spines. Then you have the granulosum. They do have granul granulin and these are responsible for the aggregation of keratin filaments. The lucidum, they're flat and clear. They're present only in the palms and the soles of your feet. And the corneum, that is the horny, the hard layer on the outside, the most superficial. For the purpose of this class, you're just expected to know the layers, not specifically the composition of them. All right? So come, let's get sunburnt. You'll remember that? Yep. Oh, what you saying? Yeah. That's great. Let me see if I can pull one. I'm sure I have one. Come, let's get sunburned. Mm -hmm. This one have come, let's get. Yeah. All right. So why is layer one then? Layer one would be what? Come, let's get sunburned. The corneum. Why is layer two then? Lucidum. Oops. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I should not have done that. Right? It would be um, lucidum. Come, let's. The third one will be get. Granulum. Granulosum. Right? Come, let's get sun. S. Spinosum. Spinosum. Burnt. Basal. Basal. Right? Uh, and that's it, five. Come, let's get sunburnt in terms of those five major layers before you get to the dermis. That's the five. And what six is? Six is the basement membrane. That's the one, right? So the basement membrane is the last layer before you get to your, what is seven now? Seven is your dermis. So the epidermis, what we are looking at here, this is the epidermal layer. And then you get to the dermal layer below. So these are the, all of these are part of the epidermis. Eight, what it, oh, it doesn't have an eight. All right, so come, let's get sunburnt. C, L, G, S, P, S, and B. We good? Nice, let's continue. Da, da, da. Let's go back to our MCQs. Within the skin, a basement membrane can be found separating what? Uh-huh. Epidermis. I just mentioned, right? Very good. We just looked at it, the epidermis and the dermis. If you were to go back to it real quick, as, as I like to say, in this um, 
in this diagram here. So this would be the basement membrane six. Um, this would be the basement membrane. And so everything above the basement, this dark line here would be the basement membrane. Everything above it, that's the epidermis. Anything below it will be the dermis. And the reason this is called the epi, epi really means like extra. Anybody could think um, of another, of anything, any other structure that has the prefix epi before it? You can think of anything? Epithelial tissue. Epith ah, epithelium, yeah, right? Epicardial uh, um, tissue, all of these things, that's the outer layer, very good. All right, let's go back. Let's go back to our MCQs. The protective dead layer of cells of the outer dermis, epidermis is called the what? What's that protective outer layer? So come, let's get sunburnt. What is this? Corneum. The corneum. The corneum. Yes, corneum. Melanocytes hmm, lie within what layer? Hmm, can't remember that one. You all remember that one? Where, where did we see the melanocyte? Um, here is the melanocyte. So where is it? What layer is it in? Between what two? Bacille and somebody. Bacille. Let's have a look, see? Right? So the melanocyte between the basale and the upper dermis, because this layer here, right? This is the dermis. So it's between this layer, the dermis, and the melanocyte, sorry, the basale. So between them, you have the melanocytes. Make sense? Yeah. Between this basale yeah. and the dermis. Yeah. Good, let's go again. Which of these phrases does not characterize the dermis? Mm. This one is not is beyond the scope of the class, but we will look at it. Loss of elasticity. Does it does the skin actually get less elastic as it get old? Does it get like kind of soft? Think about yes. when you're holding. Yes, sir. Think, yes, about, sir. think about granny yeah. skin. Yeah. Right. Sometimes granny skin hang or no, grandpa or whomsoever, right? You do lose, lose elasticity and by extension, muscle and nerve fibers as well. Think of them, anybody know any bodybuilders was a bodybuilder back in the day, but then later on, what they become, they become a little bit non, you know, it, it begins to sag. Now, do they have the conical? They do have the conical dermal papillae. So the odd one out is the nine areas receiving greater friction and use. But this one is not on the syllabus. So you don't have to worry about that one. Adipose tissue is most abundant in what layer of the skin? Hmm. Which one? Subcutaneous. I like, I like it. I like it. I like it. Let's have a look. Right? So when we look at here, in terms of the skin, this remember this region here, region three, that one would have been the subcutaneous layer. Quite right. Right? So that is the subcutaneous layer. So you're very correct in stating that. Well done. Let's go again. Here arise from which layer of the skin? Huh. If you had to say that, which layer does here arise? It does it come from the dermis? Now the dermis is all the way below. Right? So does it come from there? No, 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 no. What's the what's the mnemonic for remembering the layers again? I forgot. Come, let's get sunburned. Come, let's get sunburned. So from which layer of the skin? Do we get here from? Hmm. Well, let's have a look. Here's the hair shaft. Um, it comes all the way down. I don't like this. I don't like this image, actually. Let's see if we get a better one here. Yeah, this one is better. So what layer? There's a hair shaft. What layer is this one? Dermis. The dermis, okay. From which layer? We have the dermis. Stratum basale of the epidermis. Let's have a look at the question again. Question asked, here arise from which layer of the skin?
And yeah. <laughs> Somebody have a, a multiple choice question on it as well. So we're seeing it arising here. It's from this layer here. So this one would be, yeah, the dermis, correct is right, yeah, dermis. So most definitely the hair arises from the dermis. Now, hmm, hello, what do you notice here? Ooh, anybody seeing that? What do you notice here? Now we said the dermis, but have a look. What is happening here? Somebody talk to me. What is happening here? Anybody want to comment on that? Poor. It right, but it if you notice, it, it doesn't, so it's not like it come across. It actually goes all the way around. Yeah. It's so, in the basement membrane. Right. So what is this? What is the lowest layer? from the epidermis called? What is the lowest layer of the epidermis? What is the little um, mnemonic? Bacillus. What is it? Yeah, you have it, you have it, you have the letter. <laughs> You're saying the letter quite right. But the stratum, what is the lowest one? The bus. Basale, basale, or basale. Some people say basale. So the stratum basale or the base layer, right? So the answer would be, I like this question. You might see it again because it's so nice. And it's actually the stratum basale because if we look, you know, if we look at it, when we look at the skin and we look at the hair, it doesn't, it actually moves the whole layer is around the skin itself. I'm going the wrong direction. The whole layer is around the skin. Right, so if you look at it here, even in this one, you would notice that the stratum basale is shown here, is a dark layer. It lines the area from where the skin come from where the hair comes out. So this actually comes out from the stratum basale, the base layer. And that is quite true. All right. So do remember that one. That's a tricky one. It comes out from this stratum basale of the epidermis. Okay, within nails. So we're moving away from here now. We're talking about nails. What nails important? Yeah. What do you use nails for? Anybody, Lukisha, what do you use? Yeah, you use them for scratch. Well, in particular, when you look at some other animals, yeah, they use, you know, in protection and defensive purposes. And the other thing it does for us and enable us to pick up fine things. If we didn't have nails, we wouldn't have that strength. You know, imagine like you're picking up a pin. You know, you can you'd use the tips of your fingers. Or in fact, you might even use your nails to pick it up. And, um, that it helps to have a firm back in. It gives the skin their support. So that's another function of the nail itself. Within nails, the most rapidly dividing cells can be found in the, let me look at the nails, in the, this area called the lanula. Let's have a look at this. Right? And what is the lanula? For those people who, who get their nails did, if you were to look here, right? So the lanula is this half moon. Everybody familiar with that now? You didn't know it had a name, eh? You just know it as the, well, the little half moon area on the tips of your fingers. But that is actually your lanula. Right? And that's the only, that's the only one complex one you really would be expected to know. So, the most, the most rapidly dividing cells, they're found in that area, the lanula. Let's go to this one, 11. Modified sweat glands called blank 
secrete wax in the air canal. I mentioned it earlier. So which ones, is it sebaceous, eccrine, apocrine, or ceruminous glands? Ceruminous. Yeah. So what is another name for wax? Anybody want to make, is a shortened form of that word? Ceruminous so glands, they, they secrete cerumen. And cerumen is actually wax. C-E-R-U-M-E-N, -E -E cerumen. So that's another name for wax, yeah? So the ceruminous glands, and let's have a look. Uh, well, we're all familiar with wax. And some people, when they do clean their ears, it's very special, yes? Now, is it a good idea? <laughs> Is it a good idea to use Q-tips or you know those um, to clean your ears? These is it a good idea? No, sir. No. Why not? Because it pushing the um the Yeah, yeah, correct. Quite right. Quite right. Yeah. So just as um as your colleague there mentioned. It pushes the wax, as Lukisha just mentioned, it pushes the wax down, it compacts it. And that could cause problems. And in fact, in your professional career, you will, you more likely than not will see it, somebody presenting either in casualty or clinic or what have you not, with hearing loss based on the fact that they have too much wax in their air. And what do they have to do? They have to either one, flush it out, or sometimes use special instruments to go in and clean it out, get it all out. But usually they try, they flush it out, use saline and tools very much like a dental instrument to send down the water. So that it goes behind and could push it out. But that could lead to hearing loss. I remember in fact, one of my students about four years ago mentioned that, that he had hearing loss. And when he went to the um, ENT specialist, you know, they, they figured out what was wrong. And it was like, basically, it was like, do you have wax? a buildup of wax that formed a bit of a plug in his ear and that was affecting his hearing. So once it was removed, pow, he was back on track, All right? So, right, the ceruminous glands, these are specialized sweat glands and they produce this cerumen or air wax by mixing sebum, which is a type of oil, which is in effect is oil with dead epidermal cells. And that produces that sticky stuff we might be very well familiar with. Let's go. Heat loss occurs from the body by each of these methods, except which one? So you lose body heat by which one? Which one it doesn't, doesn't involve heat? Does evaporation involve Excuse heat? Me, yes, go ahead. I was just about to say, I don't know if it was just my screen, but I wasn't seeing the questions until now. It just came up. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, if you're not seeing anything, please inform me, yeah. I have no problem with that. I'd appreciate that. So the heat loss occurs from the body by each of these methods, except, well, cellular respiration would be the odd man out. But you do use um, all of these methods indeed, evaporation. Now I'll send this link for you. I'll paste this link in the chat so you can actually go through these and other questions at your leisure, OK? Choose a response that the body employs to raise body temperature only when the other list others no, be on the scope of the class. Um, no, I like 16, let's have a look. Which term does not belong with the others? What do you think? So the membrane one? Membrane? Why, why is it C? So I said D. D. D? All right. So you have the subcutaneous region. All right. Anything else? Huh. You have the dermis. Cutaneous membrane, subcutaneous region, and epidermis. 
I will say epidermis, sir. Why you say epidermis? Yes, epidermis because there is a higher part in the skin, there is a top part, but all the rest <laughs> is like. I like how you're thinking. Yeah, the epidermis yeah, should be the out. There's the uppermost, and all of these are below. Right? You have the dermis, the cutaneous, and the subcutaneous region. But this one is way out on the top. So it doesn't belong with these. All these others aggregate together. So, yeah, very good. All right, let's look at another. Da da da. The part of, what is it? What is it? <laughs> Would you get this? Uh, I guess you could get it. What is another term for male pattern baldness? <laughs> Interesting. It's alopecia. Alopecia is, is hair loss. Androgenic, because it's androgens, is a type of male hormones. You wouldn't get that. That's off the topic. And the last one I would look at is 25. And we looked at this already. What is the white area of the nail that reflects the rapid growth of the cells below it? What did, did we look at this one? We look at the lacuna. Did we look at the lunula? Let's have a look at our um, nail bed. Oh, we looked at the lunula. Mm -hmm. Not the lacuna. So it's the so question. Go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. The person who you don't see the white part in their nail beds, what does that symbolize? That's a very good question. I don't know. <laughs> very good question, but I just don't know. <laughs> Let's have a look. Um, absent lanula. Is that a problem? <laughs> That's a very good question. Because I you have me now looking at my fingers and you're getting me worried because I'm not seeing only I only my have my tongue. Yeah, same with me. I'm it's only on my tongue. tongue. And yeah. see me now. See me now. My blood pressure going up and my heart racing. <laughs> well, yeah, I have none at all. Right. right. So let, let, okay, you, you let's see what that means. Is it normal to have no lanula? Smaller missing, usually on cause for concern. They're usually just hidden underneath the cuticle. So we're okay. We'll still be alive then. Right? <laughs> well, this is according to Healthline, which is a reputable site. Why is my lunula? It happens when the red blood cells do not work correctly, causes an oxygen, blah, blah, blah. Mm, this is a medical paper. We ain't born in with that one too well, much. I'm a new so I hear that when you're anemic, you usually don't have it. That would make sense. Yeah. In terms but say it might be a concern for like when you're in hospital and you have to do surgery and stuff, if they need the they need to see where the blood passing and if they don't if they're not seeing it clearly, that might be a problem, I assume. If they're not seeing it, when they're looking at surgery, there are other parameters that they use to gauge your wellness as your blood pressure, it has the oxygen concentration in your blood. Um, they look at your heart, uh, ECG. Um, they do a blood test usually to check that certain parameters are ideal as it relates to the concentration of certain proteins, concentration of certain gases and so on. But I hear you, in terms maybe, maybe, what, maybe a very skilled OBGYN could look at your nails and detect it. But what they usually do for oxygen concentration, you know the meter is something like a, a like a digital clothespin that they put on the end of your finger. Yeah. 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 So they use that to measure oxygen concentration. But I'm not disputing maybe old school and they're really good at it. They could actually tell just by looking at the finger, you know, if something is wrong, if you're running an oxygen deficit. If yeah, because it does tell you when you're pregnant and stuff like that, too, in order to, what I mean, like when you're taking to labor, you're not supposed to have like no nail polish on your nails and stuff like that. One of the things I could understand why as well, because if it is you are running a serious oxygen deficit, the tips of your fingers turn blue. Yeah, it, it gets a bluish hue to them. I don't know, have you ever seen it? Or you, you might see it you, yes, on any sir. nails it gets blue and that is why in particular so you know while during the delivery it's a very quick way of, of actually gauging you know if there's anything wrong with your circulation so they could just look at the fingernails okay it's pink and healthy everything's all good if they see blue they know we have a problem we're having a circulation issue it could point to hemorrhaging maybe hemorrhaging at another site in other than interuterine, that is expected during the pregnancy. So, you know, that would be a cause of concern. But most definitely, I would say that the change of color, it literally looks blue. I, I, would, I would agree with that one. But usually, you know, these days, everything is machine, as you know. You know, so they, they'll have that um, the little 
ox, ox, what do they call the ice call it the oxygen clothespin? What's the right name for it? Pulse meter. Thank you. Pulse right? You put the, the pulse meter or the oxygen clothespin on your finger. They have it usually on all the time, and that alerts them, you know, to the oxygen concentration in your blood. So that would pick it detected way before you turn the tips turn blue. But it's a very effective way though. And a very quick way, just looking at the tips to make sure that they're remaining um, pink and healthy. Not only does it point to the blood, um, oxygen concentration being good, but it's also a measure of heart health as well. So that is why some surgeons will probably say, hey, no nail polish. We want to keep a look at those at the tips of your finger. Okay, good. So that that so for the epidermis, I want to say that's all I want to look at for today. Right, so these questions, as I say, let me, let me put it, let me put it in, let me send it to your link. I'll send it, uh, once class closes off, I'll send it, I'll send this to you, the link for this. And uh, one of the good things with this, you could look at some other chapters as well related to what we have already done and get practice. So one thing I would encourage you for the quiz that is coming um, this week, that is coming next week, sorry, on Tuesday. So out of those multiple choice questions, you probably will see <laughs> all, all the ones that I would bring would, would come from there. All right, so I'd encourage you just to review them when I put the link in the WhatsApp, on the WhatsApp page, okay? So not precise, in fact, that we're closing off class. Um, do have a look of the, at the lecture today. So the lecture has been recorded, just click on it and have a look at it. These are the notes, the PDF of the PowerPoint and um, ultimately do the um, activity sheet for next week. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. um, about the question, we were looking at uh, how the body loses heat. Mm -hmm. Yes. The really show one kind of puzzling to me. That's my uh -huh. expansion sure. a little bit. Sure, sure. I mean, how, how it is we lose heat via radiation. Let's see if we could get an image. Right? So three ways it is by con conduction, convection, and radiation. Right, in terms of how the body loses the heat. Let's see if you could get that image. Uh, I know actually. Okay, so this actually, you know, points it. Conduction refers to heat loss through contact with a cooler object. So the fact, let's say, even when you're wearing clothes, the fact that you're, let's say, um, something is in contact with your skin and it is cooler, heat passes just because of the fact it is touching your skin. And that is known as conduction, right? So the passage of heat from one object that is warmer to one that is colder or cooler, that is known just by touching is known as conduction. The other one is convection. Now convection is heat loss from wind displacing a layer of warm air near the skin. And that happens, so in other words, let's say your hands, when your hands are exposed, you lose heat to the environment. And again, that has to do because there's a temperature difference. But in this case, the wind, the wind is assisting because it is constantly blowing the heat away from your skin. And that movement of heat in which the wind plays a role in moving that heat along, that is known as convection. The last one is radiation, and radiation is heat loss from exposed. So just the fact, just the fact that the uh, your skin is exposed, heat is lost from these exposed portions to the air itself. So one, you do have the movement of the heat from your body to the air. That is radiation. So the heat, as you often hear, hear the term, the heat is radiating off of your body, right? So that is radiation. Convection is when the, break, the air now is moving that heat and the constant removal of that heat involving the use of wind, that is convection. And then the other one is conduction. Once it's touching something, so the fact that you're wearing, which is why let's say 
if you let's say you have a fever and you put on let's say a shirt after a while the shirt you know if you wear the shirt for a while let's say it's cotton and you take it off and if somebody comes and touches the cotton shirt it feels warm and that movement of the heat from your body to the cotton in that regard that one is conduction that is okay i don't know if i help you out there charles yes i i have mm -hmm. a clarity on it yes okay <laughs> Okay, I don't know. I like this image here, right? This image that is shown here, you know, and um, yeah, it's 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 really nice. This one is rather interesting. This is giving percentage, showing how you lose heat in terms of the body itself. So the convection we mentioned, the air is moving the heat off of your body. So convection happens all the time. Mm -hmm. right? the, the air. So let's say you're sitting down outside, which is why when you're feeling hot, is you feel cooler. When you turn on a fan, yeah, and the fan is moving the sweat, the hot air away. Now the now have to appreciate you're losing heat via the um the sweat evaporating, right? So the sweat evaporates off of your skin. It is getting the heat to evaporate from your body. So that has a just just the fact that the sweat is evaporating off of your skin that it has a cooling effect. The convection is brought about when you turn on, let's say, a fan, and it is moving the air. So as it moves the air away from your body, that also contributes to the cooling effect. And that is known as convection. The moving of air, which is hot, away from your, the surface of your skin, that actually cools you down. Right? So as you see here, this is 27 evaporation. This is the heat that is lost when the body uses its own heat to vaporize the water. That is known as evaporation and radiation. The fact that you are in contact with other things that are cooler than you, you lose heat to those objects. So in other words, heat radiates from your skin to the clothes. If you're sitting, it radiates to your pants, it radiates to a chair. I don't know if oftentimes you realize if you're sitting down in a couch or a chair for a while and you get up and you touch the, if it's plastic, let's say, and you touch it, you would realize that it's actually warm, right? So that points to the fact that, you know, the heat of itself, it radiates to that area, yeah? I don't know if, uh, <coughs> if, uh, if I highlighted it good there. So those are the three so ways. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. If, if they're accurate, that's a good question. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know offhand. This is probably um, a generalized. I'd have to look at the source where this information came from. And let's see if it's a reputable source. Let's have a look. Mm. Civil engineering department, introduction to civil engineering. Huh, sounds reputable. Um, let's see if, it, if he has references. One way, um, it's possibly true. I don't like the fact how it doesn't have references, you know? So this is, this is our, good, our good figure here, but it doesn't say where he gets it from. That's why it's always important, you know, to quote where you get your information from. Let's see, let's see where they got this image from. Seems to be a popular image. Domain name in progress. Ooh, I guess, and it, it, there's some formulas associated with it. Metabolic heat transfer. Wow. So there, there's some science, which I expected, you know, associated with it. And I get, but again, what is the source of this information? Well, huh, I mean, ooh, engineers. Engineering Continuing Education PDH courses. Wow, that sounds good. That sounds really good. <laughs> State licensing renewal requirements. That sounds like a really good, and look at all these states, Alabama, Arkansas. So this is material that you use for getting your license, state licensing for engineers. So I would want to say based on that, this is pretty accurate. Yes, to answer the question, I would say yes. It shows how you lose. So you lose most of your, your heat energy by radiation. Interesting. So which is why, you know, you always look 
to adjust your clothes, what type of clothing you have. And that would actually is a very good way of preventing heat loss. Yeah, so I would say yes. Okay, all right, so let me just, any other questions? So I have one question. Go ahead. Concerning the, concerning the, the um, exam. Yes. Will we be tested on all the topics that we um? It may sound stupid that I ask in this question, eh? But will we be tested on all the topics that you're taught so far? Okay, let me let me just stop the recording because um, when we when we let me just.